Welcome to uh, the fourth meeting of the Theatrically and uh, ASME Club. So uh, I hope the students enjoy their long weekend. So uh, for those who don't know, my name is Kung Wing. I am the president of the club. And uh, over there we have Bill Cantwell, our treasurer. We have uh, Frank Lynch, our secretary. We have uh, Ellie Ros Rosenthal, our second advisor. We have uh, Veronica our Vice President, and apparently we have uh, Joseph Tolley, uh, our webmaster. So, uh, yeah, today we have a very great honor to have uh, Mr. Tumte here. So, very soon I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand uh, the introduction back to Dr. Berger, but before that, I just wanna let you wanna know, you guys know that there's a sign-up sheet going around, so if you haven't done that, so please do so. Okay, so thank you, so please. Okay, before we continue, I wanted to introduce myself for those who are freshmen and welcome everybody. My name is Andrew Berger. I've been chair for, of the department for a while since I missed a meeting and I found I'm, I'm a chair. <laughs> but IEEE ASME right now, that seminar I initiated almost 30 years ago and it started innocently as a professional activity but it became very important and vital part of your education. Uh, in other words, learning from s books, every school provides that, right? But employers always are interested, what else do you do? Now, what else do you do? Where do you get ideas for that? Only from professional uh, like activities, like IEEE, our SEC conference, participate in, in, uh, in uh, competitions, various when we go the paper presentation, participating in research. And the important role of that seminar is that as indirect as it seems part of education, gives you exposure to outside world. Who I try to bring as speakers is role models, right? So role model doesn't have to be engineer. It could be somebody who is in business. It could be a doctor. It could be a lawyer, especially a patent lawyer. I don't know if you're aware, in order to become a patent lawyer, you have to have engineering degree before otherwise they won't accept you. So today's speaker is a role model who, despite the fact that he graduated as a, in, from school of business, right, and then law school, his background was through the life experience in technology, and that's how he stayed. And he will share some views with us but before, I allow Carol to formally introduce our speakers. Okay? Sure. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Carol McCullough, and I work in the advancement area of the University of Scranton. In that role, I do fundraising for the University of Scranton, mostly in the area of scholarship. If we're working on larger projects, we reach out to donors, and especially alumni who graduated from the University of Scranton. Today, Tom Tate, who is a distinguished alumnus of the class of 1956, joins us as our guest of physics and engineering. Mr. Tate donated his aerospace collection to the University of Scranton, and it's now hanging in the mechanical engineering room across the hall. So if any of you have a chance, please make it over there to see it either after the class or this evening or whenever you're passing through Highland Hall. It's quite impressive. Today, Tom shares his fascinating career highlights that spanned over four decades in the aerospace industry. His work began really at Rockwell Industries and Rockwell was a, a contractor for NASA. So they built every single spaceship that went up into space. And Tom was involved in every single one of those programs, right, Tom? Yes. Right from the Regalo Wing to the Mercury program, right. the Gemini program, and then Apollo. And it was Apollo 11 through, through 17 that went to the moon. And Tom was part of every single one of those programs, every one of those spaceships. And then the shuttle program. Right, Tom? Right. So Correct. please welcome me, well, help me welcome Tom Tate to our university. Yes. 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 
Okay. So, Tom, I have some PowerPoints here okay. that I would like you to take a few minutes sure. and uh, share your knowledge about. Okay. okay. Do you want to work on this first one, Tom? Fine. New uh, Frontiers? On the cover? Sure. Uh, yeah, that is uh, uh, a cover of all of the, some of the programs that I worked on, Shuttle and Apollo and all of those, etc. cetera. Uh, that was uh, done by, uh, uh, as you see on your on your program, John Young, John Young and Bob Cribben signed that. They were the first crew members on that mission, and uh, uh, on shuttle, and they did uh, yeoman work on that job. It was uh, quite a uh, technical challenge, and uh, they were successful. It was interesting. John Young's heart rate at liftoff was 138, if you believe it. Bob Crippen's was 235 at liftoff. Now, when they were coming back in for the first time on shuttle, Young's was 200 and some, and Bob Crippen's was 110. So, anyway, uh, the converse worked, but the. John was one of my closest friends, uh, great, great pilot, uh, Navy pilot, and uh, uh, he did a lot of wonderful things. And he was very well considered. Uh, just one quick uh, story. Uh, when, when they were designing a re escape system for shuttle, they brought John into the room, the, uh, the engineering group and briefed him on abort mission and uh, the abort mission consisted of you go up 10,000 feet if there's something wrong you pop the engines and you come on back in and these engineers that put this together were so thrilled to have John there and they said John what is what is your opinion John says to him, it is an act of God followed by five Hail Marys. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they, and they were, de they were depressed, but that was the mission that he did. So anyway, uh, John was one of my favorite friends. He is a Navy pilot. Uh, he flew first and because he was that good. And uh, that's the way uh, that charts about. And Bob Crippen was a computer expert and uh, you needed one on shuttle. Next. So Tom, this here is um, a photo from the Johnson Space Center Tribune. Right. And it's, it's a collage, so if you can, kindly just give us a little bit about the collage up here. I'm gonna point to, um, if you can see okay, yeah. on the screen. Uh, well, the first one is uh, Robert Goddard with the, uh, the rocket which he discovered, and, and uh, he was the first. Uh, the others are uh, launch vehicles all the way to shuttle. Let, and paraglider, that was the first program I worked at Rockwell. What happened was Gus Grissom, Gus Grissom uh, flew a, uh, a uh, Gemini mission, and he went into the water, and the explosive bolt on the canopy popped. Okay, uh, uh, not unexpectedly. The vehicle started sinking. He was saved, he got out, uh, didn't drown, and uh, there was always a debate whether Grissom panicked and pushed the button to blow it or it actually happened. Gus told me it actually happened. He didn't push any boats. And anyway, but it was a controversy for a while at NASA. And uh, other than that, uh, he did a great, that was a great mission. Okay. And, and up here we have. Which one is I that? I think that's an Apollo. Uh, oh, yeah, then, then Apollo was the, Apollo was the big mission. And uh, uh, a lot of competition for that. So I ended up being the uh, uh, competitive analysis of the mission. 
and my job was to make sure I understood the other bidders. There were three other bidders besides us to build the space shuttle. Lockheed, uh, McDonnell Douglas, and Grumman were the competition. And uh, it was tough competition, very tough. So they gave me the assignment, they said, Tom, you got to do the competitive analysis of this over the months as we're doing this. So I had to brief the leaders every so often about the status of everything. And uh, I used to try a couple of tricks. Number one, there's a, there's a monthly magazine put out by Frost. Uh, it's a technical magazine, but it gives every contract and the government gives to industry. And in it, there's a whole aerospace section. So I would get that from the library every month, and I'd go through it. And I'd go to the aerospace section, and i see what companies got what contracts, okay? So I noticed, uh, for example, this month, Grumman won two aerodynamic contracts, okay? So I know they're a little short in aerodynamics, but they're <coughs> working the problem. And that would be, each month I'd go through that, whoever, any, one of the contracts I'd, I'd, uh, I'd write down. So finally, at the end, before we submitted our proposal, I had to give a uh, competitive analysis, how we stood going into the final. And uh, it, was a, it was a tough thing to bring up. But uh, I said, uh, the thing that worries me, the four bidders were Lockheed and uh, Grumman and uh, uh, Martin and myself. And uh, I said to, to the executives, my pick is uh, our opponent is Grumman. And uh, sure enough, we won the contract first out of Houston, and that was another part of the presentation was they, you had to win Houston. That was the Manned Space Flight Center. That was the one I was so close to. And uh, we came out of Houston with just a few points first. And now it was going to Washington. So I told my management at Washington, listen, keep Washington on the hill alone. Don't go lobbying this thing on the hill. Where we came out of Houston with the win over Grumman and Lockheed and Martin Marietta. So here's what I want you to do is do all the things. If you get asked a question, answer it. But don't get into any discussion about it. Because we only beat Grumman by two points. And that's everything. They won the engineering part by one point. We won the manufacturing by uh, something like five points. But it ended up, we won the whole deal by two points. And I didn't want Washington to screw it up. You know, with them going up to the hill and broadcasting something. They know, told them, you know nothing about how this came out of Houston. But we did that. And uh, we ended up winning, winning the contract. So my history then changed. I was in charge of uh, uh, te uh, specifications, technical. That's the first thing you do is, OK, how, how, how big is the vehicle? Well, we had to design a vehicle 32,000 pounds because the Air Force has a super secret satellite. 32,000 pounds. But the problem was the Air Force wanted us to harden the vehicle, which means you're going you're gonna to survive a nuclear hit, okay, the vehicle. We said we can't do that because the only thing that the steel has to be that thick. And you're talking about living 30,000, you're giving 32,000 pounds to build and plus the weight we don't have an engine to do that, see. Now, in your career, you're going to learn the two classic areas, uh, F equals MA, 
four sequence mass times acceleration, believe me, you will. <laughs> right, Doc? And uh, and uh, uh, you'll learn you'll learn some of those as you go. So anyway, uh, I worked the, the worked those specs, and uh, we all worked out. We got the Air Force mad at us because they they uh, were going to dis disavow their support for shuttle. And uh, uh, but uh, we won the argument, and uh, uh, we were able to do it. But uh, the reason uh, 32,000 pounds was this, the Air Force has a uh, satellite that long. And if you look at the cargo bay of a shuttle, it's 32,000 one three quarters more in length. So we can put the whole satellite in there and fly it up and land it. So that was, uh, that was some of the things that happened. You know, they were very tenuous at the time, but uh, it worked out and uh, had uh, great missions. Uh, some of them, uh, uh, some of the things uh, that happened that were bad was uh, uh, a couple of flights. I'll just, I'll just go quickly, quickly through them. Uh, we, uh, we lost a crew. We lost a crew for uh, uh, on uh, shuttle. Uh, that was Challenger. That was the 25th flight of uh, the Challenger of the of the shuttle crew. I was there. Uh, they had scrubbed twice. My chairman and myself were at at the launch. They scrubbed twice and uh, had lunch with the crew. Uh, my chairman and myself and some other people. They were talking about weather. Weather was a problem for the next day to go back up in things. And some things happened that uh, created a, a problem the next day of the launch. But the, I'm getting ahead of myself. I could not, uh, uh, we could not stay anymore. We had to get back home. So we flew back and I went in the office, the Rayburn building, and uh, check my mail and all that stuff because we were gone maybe four or five days. And I saw it was quarter to eight. And I knew the crew went to bed at eight o'clock. And I knew, knew the members of the crew very well, good friends. And so I called each one of them uh, on the crew quarters line and talked to each one. The last one I talked to was Ellis Nonazuka. He had the most important job on that mission that mission did one thing. In space, we have what they call TDRS, Tracking and Data Relay Satellite. We have three of them, pop, 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 which means any place they fly, there's communication. Well, one of them had failed, so we had to replace it. So that was the payload for Challenger. And, and my friend Ellis Nonazuka on that mission, he was the one that would insert the uh, satellite in the right orbit. So I talked to uh, uh, each member of the crew and uh, uh, talked to Allison last and uh, I told him, I said, oh, good luck tomorrow. I said, you got the most important part of this mission. He said, yeah, I know. And I said, don't, don't screw up. We need that, we need that satellite. And uh, he said, no, I won't. He said, in fact, I'll take a picture and I'll send it to you. And only you and I'll have it. And uh, I'll use my personal camera. So I said, great, and hung up. Then went home about 8.30. And uh, next morning I went in about 7.30. And uh, most of the major stations did not cover the Challenger launch, because uh, it was kind of routine. But I had the NASA channel there, so I'm watching it live there and I watch it but, but if you recall if you if you see a picture of the accident you'll see when they get up high and remember I told you about the escape the escape at 10,000 feet well the first picture you see you see an explosion but you see this so I thought this is the board and I thought what happened is John pushed or uh, uh, Scobie pushed the two boosters 
But then I saw the explosion. I knew, I knew they were gone. So that was a tough, tough, uh, tough flight John, to watch. Here is a picture. Yeah, of, that's of a it. picture First of going it. up and yeah, and going up. And your good friend. Yeah. <clears throat> and tell us a little bit about the patch. Well, uh, a patch is a, a kind of an astronaut thing. Every crew, the commander of the crew, gets to choose a patch, uh, uh, indicative of his flight. So they, they design it themselves, and Bob McCall, who was in Phoenix, Arizona, he's uh, the artist that kind of makes the patches for them. And uh, they, all, they all have uh, the same patch and all that stuff, but uh, they're usually in, in, indicative of something. But uh, that was a great crew. Uh, there was a gal on that crew that, uh, in my eyes, was Miss America, and that was Judy Resnick. Yeah, and yeah, Judy was a, a terrific gal. PhD in uh, uh, electronics. Uh, and uh, she could play a piano like you wouldn't believe. Loved to go have a beer with the guys. And uh, she, she I, I always picked her as number one. She ended up number two, and uh, lovely, lovely gal. And she's buried in uh, in uh, Tulsa. Is where uh, Tulsa is it? Yeah, I think it's Tulsa where she lived, grew up. But anyway, uh, that's uh, the Challenger. No, great ch crew, one of the greatest crews going, etc. Um, Tom, can we take a minute now and talk a little little bit about Apollo 13? And uh, we'll, we can go through each of the pictures, but then you could talk a little bit about your good friend, Len Lenny, okay? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Well, you all know about Apollo 13 and, and what happened. One of the guys on board of that was my friend Jack Swiger. He and I... Uh, we're kind of roomies together before he became an astronaut. And he was a bachelor, and I was a bachelor at the time, and uh, had, uh, uh, we had a great relationship, played a lot of golf together, and he uh, wanted to be an astronaut in the worst way. And uh, he uh, finally was selected, finally was selected. And he was back up to Ken Mattingly, who was exposed to uh, German measles. What is? Uh, it's not. It's not measles. But he was exposed. The family was at a, a function with uh, their child, and uh, the other child had measles or something, and and uh, he was taken off the flight. Now this is 24 hours before liftoff, and Jack was backup on that flight for uh, the crew, Swagger, and. Uh, what happened was uh, he and Lovell went into the uh, simulator and spent eight hours, eight hours uh, going through the mission. And Lovell was the final say in that whole thing. And he said, okay, Jack can fly. Okay, fly us. And uh, Fred Hayes was the third on board. And uh, that was Apollo 13. <laughs> Tom, could you tell a little bit about what happened in that mission? Um, oh, yeah. Maybe yeah. some of our well, audience. Well, I, what I think, uh, I, a lot of people don't agree with me, but I think Len Lunny, who was a graduate a year before or after me here at the university, Len, uh, how I met Len, I'm at a, a, a party down at NASA, a cocktail party or something like that. I hear a whack on my back, and I turn around, and he said, Tom Tate, he said, you don't know me, but I sat in the stands at Scranton Prep and watched you beat us two years in a row, and I didn't like it a bit. And, and we laughed about it, but the, uh, he was a year behind me, and he went on to Detroit, Mercy, and then, and then right into the astronaut corps. But I, I will challenge anyone, I think their role in the conduct of, of that mission saved that mission. Now, they all say somebody else did this and did that. 
Glenn Lenny, if you saw the movie Apollo 13, they took a bunch of guys out and put them in a room and, and worked all night to come up with a jury rig system. See, what happened was the capsule started filling with, with gas, and these guys were having trouble breathing. And, uh, and why I think Glenn Lunny's part in that was so important is uh, when Swigert got back safely and all that stuff, we played golf one time, and I said, uh, how did you put that unit together to kill the CO2 gas? And he said, well, uh, I followed, I followed Lonnie's people, what they gave me to a T. And that's why I think he should have gotten credit, much more credit than he got for that mission. Now, he graduated a year after I did here. And he went on to Detroit and engineering and then went right to NASA. And uh, was, uh, was a star at NASA. And he and I became great friends over the years, kidding me all the time about basketball. But uh, anyway, I, I loved him. And uh, he should have received a lot more credit than he did. A lot of people take credit for the success. And you know the old story, success has a thousand fathers or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's, that's what happened with Glenn. But uh, in my opinion, if Glenn's people and Glenn did not work all night because they did not deliver until about 4.30 in the morning and they started about 11 o'clock at night with a system. Now you got to realize, as you, as you sit here and think, they had to build something of equipment on board the spacecraft. So you had to design something. So if a guy says to me, well, let's just put a just put a cardboard piece here. The next question is, do we have it on board? Okay. So Jack, knowing the vehicle, Swigert, and being the pilot, knowing the vehicle the way he did, he knew where everything was on the thing. So Lunny's people directed the building of that on. Then the interesting thing came, which is, okay, we're going to see if it works. Okay. Now, in the meantime, Jack is about passed out, and he's flying the thing. And the reason I know this, when he, he got back and then we played golf one time, I said, Jack, how, how uh, bad were you with the CO2 at the time? He said, Tom, I was already lightheaded, and I was starting to scare the fact that I got to push buttons. So what he did is he put little pieces of paper in a button that he was not to push. And that's what he did to save so he would not push the wrong button because he said, I was disoriented. In his opinion, if probably 10 minutes more, they were, he would have been gone. He would have been gone with the, with the SO2 on it. And that's why I think Lunny's effort because they worked something like seven, eight hours all night, all night. He put his team together and did that thing. If they didn't do that, well, Jack, maybe 15 minutes at most, they would have lasted. And it would have, they would have died quickly, but uh, didn't want that. So anyway, that's what happened with that mission. Anyway. Tom, can uh, we just go through the pictures a little bit from that Apollo 13, sure, if you'd like? Sure. So this well, was lift off. Right? That's the launch. Yeah, that's the launch, <clears throat> and that's a picture of the moon, which they they never got to see. I never got in person to land the spacecraft, and uh, that's uh, that's kind of a picture of. Uh, the back end of the move where the explosion was. And the next one is the, the landing coming down with the three shoes. See, that was another thing. They could not, and they all had to say their prayers coming in because they didn't know with the explosion whether it blew up the sheet or the, 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 par the paraglider. The, uh, Parachutes. Yeah, uh, and whether that, whether that happened. 
and uh, there were so many things uh, to to go through. It's the only time in my life, you know, the old saying: if you're a, a poker player or something like that, and you get nervous, you, your hands get wet a little bit. You know, when you get real nervous. Well, let me tell you, the only time that that happened to me, with my hands getting wet, was when they said, "Okay, let's try the system to see if it works." And it was slow in doing. So far, so far, okay. So far, so far, until they got over the over the top, and it worked. Honest to God, it was that lucky. And all they had to do was. Uh, is not make that, and they were they were like Jack said they would they would be dead. So that was uh, that's why I, I was a great fan of Glenn's. Uh, we became a lot of a lot of friends, kidded each other. So I went to St. Pat's in Oliphant, Pennsylvania, and uh, he went to prep. He lived in Old Forge and uh, went to prep in one of the early classes. So that's why. Uh, Tom, this is um, Space Shuttle Columbia, yeah. and this is the maiden voyage. Right. Can we talk about the space shuttle now and the maiden voyage and, um, and some yeah. of the work that that did? I don't know uh, what new I can tell you about that mission. It was... Uh, you talked about the... John Young, John Young, John Young and, and Crip did an... Uh, we did not know, and one thing that you all learn uh, in your in your uh, careers uh, in engineering, you'll find the biggest problem you'll have at launch is data. Uh, the data people that put all the computer stuff together and all that. All the time you get you get scrubs, you get scrubs, you know, because somebody put a wrong delta in something. And uh, it pops off, and you uh, and you have to start all over again. Fix that, and then start all over. So it's uh, uh, even on shuttle. The first shuttle, of I uh, we scrubbed uh, we scrubbed uh, once. Second time it went. The first shuttle mission. But that's that's what happens. But you guys and gals are going to be making those kind of decisions. I don't have to make them anymore. Okay. <laughs> I've been there, uh, but let me tell you, you're all going to be challenged because you're on the frontier of the future, believe me, and the world is moving so fast, you cannot believe stuff that's on the drawing boards. But you, one of these days, and I, I, I will end by saying that uh, I've watched grown men cry. I watched grown men that were responsible for something, like the engines, for example. Uh, when we had our review with NASA before the award, the chairman of the board uh, was with us, and I was responsible for the, the uh, inputs on, on the competition. But I, I saw grown men very success, uh, very successful engineers going to the red the restroom and throwing up. They were so scared when we went to the final review by NASA to pick a contractor. I mean, this guy, Ed, Ed Fields, very close friend of mine, a beautiful guy, did all the engine work. He couldn't stay out of the bathroom because he had to speak at the orals on uh, the quality of the engine and whether they were favored and all that. And these guys were so uptight, it was unbelievable. And uh, so that was a very, uh, very key time, very key time. But anyway, that's what happened. I, uh, I got in an argument, not this one quick aside, my friend will be on my back here. Uh, Apollo 13 mission was over. So the crews did a mission around the country, going to the contractors and thanking them for all that, right? So they came to Rockwell, and uh, they were awarded and all that stuff. 
and and uh, all the employees turned out. It was a great it was a great day. So we're getting ready for shuttle orals. So the chairman of the board said, "I want a 15-minute uh, film of what we got, our work, and what we've done in the past, and all that stuff." So I go. Uh, I'm thinking, what would be clever? Because I I had to wor I worry about the orals coming up, which is very what I call pucker time. You know, you have no time except take care of the problem. And I had an idea. So I go to the personnel, or not personnel, but uh, uh, PR, uh, and say, you're putting the film together. I got something that you should put in the film, especially at Houston. And they said, what is that? And I said, if you recall, when the crew was here, Neil Armstrong spoke last. And what he did in his speech, he talked and thanked the employees for all their work. And then he said, I flew every North American aviation, which was North American aviation at that time, not Rockwell. I flew every vehicle they ever built. And I never worried about anything. So I go to PR, and I said, you're putting the film together, promoting North America and all that. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I said, I got an idea. I said, you got the tape clip of that, right? And I said, yeah. And I said, put that tape at the end. We're going to NASA, Houston. Neil is living in NASA, Houston. What more could be better to end this movie? And they, oh, no, no, no. It has to be this, and I said you're making a mistake. Well, I go to I go to my uh, chairman, and I said this ought to be in this Houston film that the NASA employees see. So he called PR, and they put it in reluctantly. The PR people put it in, but I am sitting in the back as the uh, orals are taking place and watching the faces of the NASA people on the whole, it was 15, 20 minutes deal that you had to make your case. At the end, it's in there, right? I look at the NASA people looking at each other smiling, and I said, that was worth it. And uh, they gave me a copy of the film, PR people did. So, uh, I don't know, I had an interesting career, and then I got a call from the White House, or not the White House, but from Congress, and they wanted to talk to me. So anyway, what happened was, uh, I go to my president and say, Chairman of the House Science and National Science Committee wants me to come to Washington. And I didn't want to go to Washington. My wife didn't want to go to Washington, but he said, well, you've got to go. So I went back to see him, and he was one of my, chairman was one of my heroes. He had won every award in World War II that was given except the Medal of Honor. He was wounded. He had his leg blown off uh, a week before the German war ended with a mortar and stuff like that. And he was a great, great congressman. He was my boss. So I get this call from the secretary, said he would like to come. I want you to come to Washington to see him. So uh, I, I went to Washington. My wife didn't want me to go, but she's a Western girl. And uh, I go, and he uh, says, Tom, I don't know you. But I heard a lot of good things. And I said, well, thank you, sir. And he said, I want you to come work for me on shuttle. You know shuttle, right? And I said, yes. I knew it from the idea. So he said, but uh, I can only offer you two years. And I, I said, I'm not, not too sure I want to pack a house, sell a house in Washington or in uh, LA and come to Washington for two years. And uh, anyway, I spent 15 years there uh, on the committee. And that's, that, that was uh, my Washington experience there uh, on the Hill. And uh, 
that's I ended up uh, chief of staff of the uh, science committee and we had only PhDs as staffers and uh, but you couldn't believe every quarter I would get <clears throat> probably 75 resumes maybe 30 of them would be comp where they would come for nothing no salary just they wanted it on their resume and uh, so I, I'd go through them, and if we needed somebody, we'd, we'd pick them up. But uh, that was always a, a contention of uh, hiring uh, on the Hill. So that's what, uh, that's, what, that's what I did for 15 years. And then the uh, aerospace industry has a, uh, has a uh, organization in Washington, just like everybody else. and. Uh, they asked me to come and be their legislative aide. My wife, my wife, who was still in Washington, even though she couldn't miss California, but uh, miss California, and uh, she uh, she went along with it. And uh, I I left after 15 years of uh, on the Hill, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Then I went and was the. Uh, Vice President of Legislation for the Total Industry. And we had 54 companies. You name any aerospace company, uh, and uh, we represented them. I had to represent them on the Hill in everything except money. Okay, that was left to the companies themselves when it comes to money or donations and stuff like that. I didn't get involved in that. It, it was mostly just legislation. So I did that for 15 years. Then my wife gets sick. God love her. She gets sick, and it's not going to be fun. But I walked into work one day, and I said, boys and girls, I'm out of here. And they said, what? And I said, I'm retiring. As of today, I'm retiring. And I'm going to stay home and take care of my wife. Well, she lasted seven years. So seven years, I would get phone calls every other day from somebody in the aerospace world calling me and saying, you know, what do you think of this idea and that idea and that kind of stuff? And I, I did it. I didn't charge anybody anything, uh, but I just took care of her for seven years. And uh, we had 48 years of marriage. And she was a success in her wife. She, uh, she worked at NASA where I met her. That's a whole other story. I won't bore you with it. But she, uh, she was an exceptional woman. She used to carpool with Neil Armstrong. For uh, seven years, she did that. And he, she said he was the nicest guy you ever want to meet. And they were good friends. When we had the 20th anniversary, of uh, <coughs> Apollo here at the uh, in uh, uh, Washington, uh, we went to it, and Neil was there, of course. And Neil and she met up after so many years apart. And uh, yeah, she had a great life. She spent 30 years with NASA. That's how I met her. But that's a whole other story, and I don't need to bore you with it. But Tom, can we talk a little bit about? Um this slide here with the University of Scranton banner. Oh, oh yeah. Well, and uh, here's the Discovery yeah. shuttle. Yeah. Well, uh, I was uh, I was still I was still uh, working. I think I was still working for the industries, and uh, I noticed all of these guys on the on the shuttle flights were taking banners. So I call my friend George Abbey who was the center director at Matt, uh, Man Space Flight Center in Houston. I, called, I said, George, you got to do me a favor. And I, uh, he said, what? And I said, how about flying a University of Scranton banner on the next shuttle flight? So he said, I'll see what I can do. I knew he would do it. And uh, that's how it got on that mission. And then, uh, NASA gave it to me after they landed, and uh, 
I gave it to uh, Joe McDade, who was the member of Congress, to donate for his library here. Now they've transferred it to this exhibit here now. But that's the genesis of that, and uh, George and I, because he, he was a Naval Academy grad, you know, and uh, Scranton wasn't high on his list. <laughs> but anyway, he did it, and, and if you read in that book, you see a story that he wrote about me. And uh, uh, George is quite a guy, quite a guy. And he's running a show in Houston. Uh, he was, uh, he retired uh, a while back, but uh, he ran the show for years. Picked all the astronauts uh, to make the program. He said the toughest one, just I'll take one more second on astronaut. The toughest one was when uh, Anna Fisher was selected. She was a doctor, medical doctor. She was selected and her husband, George, had to turn down. He, he didn't have the qualifications that George had in mind, etc. But Anna did. So he had to call both of them and tell one that she was accepted. And he said, then I had to tell Bill that he was rejected. But Bill did a smart thing. He said to George, can I call you sometime and you tell me what I'm lacking? He did that, and he was selected in next class. So that's the way that went. But a little aside, like that, able to help. I helped one guy, I helped one fella that George called me one time and said, Tom, you gotta help me with some legislation. I said, legislation, what do you want? And he said, I have an employee that never went to college, does not have a degree, and he's my best mission control guy in the industry, the best. But he doesn't have a college degree, therefore I can't give him a raise. So I, uh, I said, I'll see what I can do. So I got down and talked to my chairman. So we were getting ready to put a new bill in for the year. And uh, I said, why can't we slip for the relief of the individual, okay? And we got it in there. And uh, they were able then to fund him the rest of his career. And to this day, he doesn't know how that happened, but that's how it happened. And uh, just one of those stories, but uh, I could tell you uh, many, but I don't want to bore you. But I want to tell you, each one of you are in a tough position because you're going to be competing with some very bright people. Never take India short. They are so close, they are so close to Russia, or to China, it's unbelievable. China is, is going like crazy. Uh, India is second and we're third. And uh, a lot of our third is up and down. We're, we're going this way and going, and then people change, et cetera, et cetera. So right now, that's, if I had to rank them, that's what I would do is have China first and, and uh, see, I don't know if they ever signed the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space Treaty. Nineteen nations did. If they did not sign it, that means that if they, when they go to the moon, they can do whatever they want on the moon with impunity, okay? If they sign, then it has to be a cooperative venture. Anybody that goes can use that, that mine of minerals. And uh, the scientists at NASA tell me that there's, a, there's several, several minerals that exist up there that are wonderful that we don't have on Earth. And that would be our goal of mining those and getting those back on a shuttle. So I don't know. I don't know what else. Tom, let want. me take a minute. Dr. Berger, do we have time for questions? Or? We have time a couple of minutes right now. Okay. okay. I may have one right away. Since you know, one of the famous daughters and sons that northeastern Pennsylvania produced, including politicians in one dimension. Oh, oh. Right. If you could reminisce those times when you were sure, young, sure. How well, was University of Spain? Yeah. Well. Okay, I'll, I'll do a quick version of uh, my education in business. What happened was, uh, in high school, 
uh, played sports. And my whole life was sports, okay? I was president of the class and all that stuff. But I really didn't worry about school. Uh, I, I did well, but I didn't really put any time into it. And uh, along comes uh, graduation. And I was uh, all scholastic, and I played in the, the second uh, line at Memorial Tournament, and we won it, okay? Not bragging, but I had 22 points. <laughs> and we won 52-50, we won and I had 22 of the points. But anyway, I had five scholarships to college, all out of town, different colleges. King's was the closest in Wilkes-Barre. And uh, my mother and father didn't want me to go. My father didn't care that much. My mother wanted me to stay home and go to Scranton. Now, in those days, and you, you, you're not affected by this, in those days, if you got a scholarship, the college could let you go after two years if you were not starting or close to starting. It was a burden on you, okay? You had to play good ball in your freshman year and sophomore year to get on a steady roster. And I know fellas, friends of mine that did that and got bumped out, okay? So my father says to me, Tom, listen, your mother doesn't want you to go away. Because one was uh, Canisius in Buffalo and one was uh, Oklahoma State in Oklahoma. What the hell am I going to do in Oklahoma? But anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, they were all over, but none from Scranton. Uh, and uh, what happened was uh, Kings gave me one, and my father says to me, Tom, you do not have to be beholden to anyone. I will pay your way to school if you would go to Scranton. And if you want to play ball, go play ball. If you don't, it's fine with me. So anyway, that's what I did. I ended up coming to Scranton. Now, my big dilemma, of which you all don't have this problem, what do I do? What do I take? I, did, I, I was a good, I, I did all right in school, high school, but now, what do I go? Do I go into medicine? Do I go into law? Or I had no idea what to do, because I could care less at that time. But I thought to myself, I ought to go to business school, or I ought to go to accounting or something, so at least I have something when I get out of school, right? <coughs> that's how I ended up, that's how I ended up in the business school. I didn't know what, what to take, and that's the way it happened. Tom, let me follow up with that, though. Um, as we discussed your Jesuit education, oh, yeah, and, and yeah. how that changed yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Well. Remember one thing, remember one thing. If, if there's nothing else that the Jesuits teach you is to think and be on your own and to think the problem through and look ahead, okay? And uh, the, the, the Socratic method is that way, okay? When you ask a question, like I had one time with Father Walmart, I, I raised my hand, we were in cosmology. I, I asked the question. And he said, what do you mean by this, sir? And I had to explain what I meant there. And then he said, well, what do you mean by this statement? Before he finished, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> but that was their statement. So that helped me a lot when I went into industry after, after military school. I knew nothing about that at RCA, although uh, ballistic missiles were built by RCA. Navajo and the Zeus missiles were built in long before your people time and uh, uh, I had to uh, get a job and uh, I went to RCA because they just won this big contract uh, for the Air Force etc to build a defense system that exists today and it's it's the only system that gives you 15 minute warning of a missile heading toward your place. And up to that time, there was a, what they called the dew line the Air Force had, and that's distant early warning system, and that is seven minutes. So Air Force wanted it. They gave the contract to Rockwell, 
I had gone to guided missile school and, uh, and AAA, so I applied and they hired me. And they put me in the project office, but worrying about, uh, uh, not radiators, but uh, I had to worry about a piece of the hardware I knew nothing about. The first day on the job, I go out in the factory and meet the guy in charge. And I told him how ignorant I was in the area, but I've got to keep a report on it, uh, being in the project office. So he and I became friends, and it served me well. Then Sputnik hits, and uh, a little, little dilemma about that. And uh, I decided I'm going to go to NASA. So that's what I did, and that's how I got to NASA. Knew nothing about anything other than radars at the time. And, and that's it. But my career, I was fortunate, career grew, grew in it and spent uh, close to 15 years at, at uh, Rockwell and then uh, 15 years on the Hill and about 17 in uh, private industry representing the industry. And that Tom, comes I'm to so sorry, career. I have to interrupt. Okay, I'm done. I think yes. uh, Dr. Berger, if you want to close it down. To yep. uh, yeah. Yeah. We need to go to classes, right? We would like to thank Tom. Oh, okay.